I'm really excited because I've got a friend of mine who's going to be joining us in just a moment. And we're going to be talking about how company culture impacts sales. So let me tell you first quickly about um, my guest who's going to be joining us. His name is Steve Simpson, and he's an author, a change agent, and he's an international speaker who works with companies to transform their workplace cultures. So what do we do? We invited Steve on the show. So Steve, warm welcome. Let's get Steve here. Hey, good morning, Steve. How you doing? Great, Tom, and it's great to be with you. So let's let's get right to it. Um, one of my uh, things that I love to do when we're when we're talking about a topic is to never assume that everybody knows what the heck we're talking about. So um, the, the, the topic here is how company culture affects sales. Could you please, Steve, just share with us in your experience, what the heck is culture? Let's start there. Tom, this is a really good starting point. And I think it's a necessary starting point because I think over the years, there's been an interesting paradox that has emerged. And that is, the term culture, the word culture, workplace culture, corporate culture has increasingly been used over the last 10 to 20 years. You know, it's even referred to in sporting teams now, like, and that never used to be the case, but it's been used increasingly. But the paradox in my view is that very few people understand culture in simple and practical terms. What we mm. don't understand, we can't manage. What we don't manage, we become victims of. And I think many people, know that their workplace culture might not be quite as good as it could be, but feel a bit powerless to do anything about it. So th for that reason, I created the concept of UGRs, which stands for Unwritten Ground Rules. UGRs, Unwritten Ground Rules, which I define as people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. So they can include things like at our meetings, it isn't worth complaining because we know nothing will get done. Uh, the only time anyone gets spoken to by the boss is when something is wrong. Uh, the company talks about the importance of customer service, but we know th other things are more important, so we don't really have to worry about it, and so on. So these UGRs drive our behaviours, yet they are seldom talked about openly. It's the UGRs, the unwritten ground rules, that are your culture. Culture is simply people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. So if we understand UGRs, we understand culture. So I think that's a necessary starting point, Tom, because in the absence of that practical knowledge and able to get your hands on something, then what are you managing? You know, And that's a real problem with culture, I think. I love that, Steve. So UGRs, unwritten ground rules. And I love how you, you've coined it and you've, you've actually trademarked this term. This is yours, which is awesome, right? So what I love about this, this, this concept of unwritten ground rules is because we've all been in situations where there's written ground rules, right? Here's the code of conduct. Here's the policies and procedures. Here's how we do things here. And yet, you know, like in a manual, and yet it, 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 behind the scenes, things are sometimes done differently or we see people not actually following those rules and there's actually some unwritten ground rules, right? So wh why is it so important for a company to actually be aware of these unwritten ground rules? Well, um, Tom, you see, this is another really important point and that is what's the business case for culture? Hmm. You know, it's, I think so often people assume make the assumption, well, culture is important and therefore we should do, some, do something about it. But they haven't actually made the business case, even in their own mind, for the need for an improved workplace culture. So we did some research a while back. And to be honest with you, Tom, we stumbled across this question. And I think this is a really vital question. The question we asked in our research was this. If the culture of your workplace was to become as good as it realistically could, how much improvement would there be on people's performance slash productivity? Now, we gave people a sliding scale. Started at zero because zero is a legitimate answer. You might think the culture now, realistically, is as good as it's going to get. So zero is a legitimate answer. Okay. And then we gave people a sliding scale, 10%, 20%, up to 100%, and 100% plus. Tom, we were gobsmacked by the results. And so much so that whenever I get in front of a leadership team now, I will ask this question if I can. 
and I'll get people to reflect on their own company and put a percentage on this. If the culture of your workplace mm. was to become as good as it realistically could, how much improvement would there be on people's performance slash productivity? When I do this face to face, in fact, I did it yesterday with a company I'm working with. I did it yesterday and the average across the leadership team was around 45%, 45%. So now, let me say that, something here, Steve. So, I mean, that's amazing, right? And I hear the 45%. And of course, this is self-reported, right? So this is unquantifiable, which kind of leads me to my, my thought is that if you were to ask me that question, because of course, as a, as a, as a leader of a company, I'm always thinking about these types of questions as well. I could be dead wrong here, Steve, but I don't know if there is an answer because we don't know. The potential is, is, is limitless, isn't it? Well, it is, but leaders intuitively have a sense of the productivity and the engagement levels of their people. Mm. And so, you know, people ask me, I'll often ask this question prior to introducing them to the concept of UGRs. And I'll say to people, if they ask me, which doesn't happen often, but they'll say, sometimes say, well, what's your definition of culture? And I'll say, well, mm. whatever definition you have in your mind, you use that. And they'll think about the level of engagement. They'll also think about how well this work area works with this work area, whether they're siloed or whether there's real cooperation among different teams. They'll think about all those things. And typically, typically when we do this, the average is around 40%. The company yesterday was a little bit higher. In our research, we discovered this. We discovered that 98% of senior leaders mm -hmm. said 20% or more. 58% mm -hmm. of middle managers, so that's six out of 10 middle managers, said 50% or more. Now, and in addition to that, one quarter of non-managers said 80% or more improvement would occur. <laughs> so I get people to reflect. Who's more likely to be correct? Well, it's the non-managers, right? They know what's really going on. Mm. So, so there's this enormous capacity for performance improvement that rests at our feet. It is the culture of our workplace. And when mm. I get figures like I got yesterday of 45%, I say to the leaders, get excited by this because you are saying that there's enormous capacity for improvement that rests at our feet. It is the culture of our workplace. Right. And we've, we should be tapping into that as much as we possibly can. Where else would we get that magnitude of performance improvement um, other than through our culture? So that's exciting. It is exciting, Steve, because that's, you know, not kind of an easy fix in terms of it doesn't require, you know, a huge capital investment, doesn't require expanding into new markets, doesn't require, you know, developing new products or services or a, a new go to market strategy or anything like that. It's sort of like you can look inside yourself, inside yourself as an organization and decide, you know, how do we want to be? Who do we want to be? So I really love that. I mean, you know, we, we do a lot of these types of things as well, which are kind of, you know, self rating. And then, of course, you know, we need to be able to quanti you know, qualify these things with, with, with data afterwards, you know, measuring, you know, you know, what was your culture like and what, what are some of the, the metrics or key performance indicators of culture pre-transformation and then, and then post, right? But I'm really curious about, okay, so this just reminds me, Steve, I was chatting with a sales leader and I remember he said, Tom, can, can you help us create a sales culture in our organization? And I said, well, actually, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is you already have a sales culture. The bad news is it probably sucks. <laughs> so you have a culture. It's not like you, you do or you don't. Like, like you have a culture. It's just have you defined it, described it, identified it, and, and is it what you want, right? So why, why is, you know, improving i mean we, we've seen some stats here but why is it so important for companies to really focus on the culture within the organization and then can we talk more about what 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 does it look like what are some examples of culture but maybe if we can just start first with just kind of closing the loop on why is it so important for companies to 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 make a priority of improving organizational culture um well there's evidence out there uh the, there's a book written by Cotter and Heskett, and this is going back a while. And and what they did is they they did extensive research to track the performance of U.S. companies 
across every measure of performance. And they correlated that with their culture. And they found absolutely strong evidence of there being a strong positive relationship between positive productive cultures and performance by various different measures. So there is evidence out, out there that shows a very strong link between the two. Uh, my personal experience, I worked with Kmart in Australia and New Zealand over an eight year period. Prior to that, they had literally lost money, literally for 10 years in a row. They were purchased by West Farmers, a major conglomerate here in Australia, and they put in a new leadership team headed up by Guy Russo, the best leader I've ever met. They transformed their culture. Now they are Australia's leading retailer. Oh. Pre-COVID, we were making profits to the tune of half a billion dollars. Now, that's big in Australian terms. Guy Russo, the best leader I've ever met, said at a public forum that I was at, and this was from for companies, the audience was different companies, and he said this, he said, there's only two things you've got to worry about, your business model and your culture. That's it. So oh, look, there's evidence, there's evidence out there that says culture is vitally important and it pays off if you get it right um, at various levels. It's vitally love, important. Love that, Steve. And, and while you were talking, I did some quick Googling and I think you're referring to the uh, Corporate Culture and Performance book that was written by Harvard Business School. This was Cotter and Heskett in 1992, am I right? That's it, that's it, Tom. <laughs> awesome, cool. I mean, so that, that why, like why would I forget that title? <laughs> Corporate Culture and Performance, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it sounds like a really a really good read, and, and I, I've always believed that there's a huge link between culture and, and performance, so we're gonna unpack this in a little bit. So we've talked about, obviously, what culture is. It's the behaviors, the norms, the language, the attitudes, the everything about the who we are, right? I mean, that's that's your your culture. And it's so important because that has an impact on every single thing you do. So the next question that I that I wanted to talk about is, so when I was talking with this one sales leader and I said, yes, you have a culture, good news, bad news is it probably sucks, is because there are certain signs, right? Certain signs that, you know, you don't have the optimum culture. So Steve, what would be some indicators or some signs or some clues for the leaders out there and perhaps Charles, who's wondering about, you know, improving the motivation of, of his sales force? What are some signs, clues, indicators that you don't have the optimum culture? So, Tom, that's a really interesting question. And um, I think most of us know what clues, what signs we can tune into. Um, a new employee to a company, and it doesn't matter how senior they are, a new employee will normally stay quieter when they start their job, right? I mean, this mm. is almost 100%. Mm. Now, why do we stay quieter? Well, we stay quiet to check out what the UGRs are. Now, this isn't a conscious act. It's a function of being human. We will, in, in fact, whatever new group we're confronted with, we will normally stay quieter than we otherwise would. Why? Because we're checking out the UGRs, the unwritten ground rules. Why? Mm. In order that we can conform. That's the power. Most of us conform, not all, but most of us conform to the UGRs that confront us. Uh, so we form our view of this is the way we do things around here. Now, that might include, and by the way, not always negative. Um, the, UGRs can be very positive. If you have a positive team right now, it has to be the case that there are positive UGRs. So they're not always negative, but we will conform to the prevailing UGRs. So what, what do we tune into? We look at, well, how openly do people share information? Do they share it freely or do they are they a little bit guarded? Um, mm. how, how do bosses treat staff? What happens when things go wrong? Um, are meetings... Um, at a meeting, do people contribute at meetings or do they stay quiet? Mm. Is a different point of view ever raised at a meeting? What is said immediately after a meeting? Um, mm. What happens when somebody is really under the pump at work? They've got massive, heavy workload. Do people notice? Do they do anything? Do they care? What about somebody who's got grief in their personal life? Do they mm. notice? Do they do anything? Do they care? So we, we know this because we all do this. We tune into this almost infinite number of cues 
to form our view of this is the way we do things around here and the vast majority of us conform. And mm. we know when the UGRs are counterproductive. We know that. But the remarkable thing is that mo on most occasions, very little, if anything, is done about it. Um, mm. And that's a sad situation because we can grab a hot... Tom, here's a really, I think, interesting point. To the extent that there are unhappy people in the workplace, the vast majority of them do not want it to be that way. They have merely given up hope of it being any different. And I include leaders in this as well. Um, and that's where I think the concept of UGRs can have a huge part to play because all of a sudden we give people language and a process and a structure to grab a hold of and do something about it. Um, but I'm going on too long, Tom. So no, I think, this is so, I think this is so great. You know, I mean, what, you know, some like ind indicators that, you know, your culture sucks, you know, things like maybe no one knows what the, you know, you talk about the, the un unwritten ground rules. So no one knows what the ground rules are, right? So there's ambiguity, there's vagueness, people don't know, um, you know, what are the company values? You know, what do we actually, what do we stand for here? And maybe people don't know what those values are or they're not communicated, or maybe even worse, they're written down somewhere on a piece of paper or on a, on a, on a, on a billboard in the office, but then your leaders are doing the exact opposite. I mean, does, does this, is this common, Steve? Uh, very, very, very common. And um, I, when, I, when I work with leadership teams, I will ask this question, and I think this is a vital question. I will say to leaders, if I went to your people and you're not in the room, leaders, you're not in the room, and mm -hmm. your people are being open and candid and honest with me, I will, and I ask them this question, how will they answer this question? So you're not in the room, leaders. What are your leaders' top three priorities? Now, Tom, this has got an interesting consequence for sales as well, because I have asked many leadership teams this question. What are your leaders? So I've gone to your people and I've asked them, what are your leaders' top three priorities? And on many occasions, the leaders will admit that the staff would say the top three priorities, sales, sales, and sales at any cost. Mm, at any cost. <laughs> now, mm. that's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Because if that's what people think, then it is sales at any cost. Yep. And if it means, if it means um, doing something bad for one of my so-called teammates, or co-workers, then so be it, because sales right. is most important. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is so important. Yeah, you know, I love what you say there, Steve, about, you know, the, the, un, the unwritten or unspoken, right? The unwritten or the unspoken ground rules. And it's sort of like if people go, oh, we value customers, but it's like, mm, if you don't close that deal, you're not hitting quota or you're going to be let go, right? So then the unspoken, the unwritten ground rule is, I need to close that deal at any cost. So what does that mean? It could mean um, putting unnecessary pressure on my colleagues to, to push something through to get it done. It could be being a bit you know, fast and loose on compliance things, not getting people to sign, not being you know, full disclosure around certain things, not going through the fine print with customers, trying to close that deal now and let customer support or success or customer service deal with the problems later, right? Yep. It could be selling a product to a customer that they don't really need, right? So there's ethical issues as well. So I think the implications are huge. And for any sales rep out there, that, that feels like, hey, w whatever, but I'm still hitting target. Well, good luck getting any repeat business. Yeah. Because, you know, we hear that expression about trust, that it, it takes years to build, moments to lose, and a lifetime to regain. So good luck getting any repeat business, any spinoff business, any referrals from that customer if you're not treating them them well. You know, another thing that, that you know, a, a sign perhaps that you've got a bad, bad company culture is a lot of gossip happening in the office. You know, a lot of people kind of talking under their breath and, you know, maybe it's because they don't know what's going on, right? And there's there's a lack of communication happening from, from management. So, you know, people are left to themselves to try to, you know, figure out what's going on. I mean, to me, that's a toxic environment, isn't it? 
Hundred percent, hundred percent. So again, as a new employee, you will again unconsciously tune into the conversations that happen. So mm. um, if there is a, well, you look at um, lunch breaks. Is there a lunch break? Do people gather together and have lunch together, or do they sit at their desks? Mm. Um, but you know, even at water coolers, what do people talk about? Are they talking about the company? Are they talking about bosses? And what's the nature of that conversation? Is it mostly negative? Mm. So you're, you're dead right, Tom. Um, I'd want to tune into the extent to which there is gossip and um, whether it's at, at the expense of bosses or people who aren't in the room at the time. There's all these things that we tune into, again, unconsciously, to form our view of this is the way we do things around here and the vast majority of us conform to those prevailing UGRs. As an aside, I think yeah. this is a source, a massive source of workplace stress which has mm. been totally unexplored, and that is when I, as an employee, feel compelled to conform to UGRs that go against my personal values. And I think that is totally, that area, that whole domain has been totally unexplored, but is, I think, a massive source of workplace stress. Yeah, that's huge. But, you know, I think that's huge, you know, on that topic of, of, of gossip. You know, I think people gossip in a company um, because that's a symptom, right? The gossip is a symptom of a bigger problem, which is a lack of communication or a lack of transparency in the company. So, you know, for example, you know, we had someone on our team who's been with us for a few months, but, you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't work out. The role has changed and this individual wasn't able to kind of step into this new role that we need, even though we were trying to work with this person for, for several months and to try to find the right spot for them. Uh, but unfortunately, it just wasn't a fit anymore. So we had to let them go last week, right? We, we, we love them. They're great. It just didn't fit where we were now and where we were going. So the first thing we did, we had an honest conversation with this person and then let the whole team know right away what happened, why the person is leaving and, and, and the reason for it, you know, without getting into details or specifics about, oh, whether, you know, not saying anything mean about, oh, they're incompetent because it's not that they were, that they were. The issue, just being transparent with our team about, um, you know, moving forward, there are things that we need to do in this company. And there's there's a couple of roles that we need to fill. And we were hoping this person could fill that role. But unfortunately, they, they can't. We couldn't get them to fit the role and we couldn't get the role to fit them. So it just wasn't a good match. So unfortunately, you know, we had to end our working relationship. And then we said, look, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, like our, our virtual door, because we're all working in a virtual environment our virtual door is, is always open. And then the feedback that we got from the team was very, very positive. You know, they were loving that. So it's like, it's transparency and honesty and openness, I think is, is one thing that one can do. Otherwise, if you don't do that, then people start gossiping and go, hey, what, are they firing people left, right and center? Are they on a firing spree? Am I next? So you gotta just let people know what, you know, what's, what's going on, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? Oh, 100%, Tom. And, you know, I think you're making a very good point there that gossip often uh, emerges to fill a void, mm. you know, where there has been a lack of communication. So what, what you're doing there is fantastic. Oh, and, and thank you very much. That, that's all that can be expected, you know, but, that's, but, th but things like that are so often not done. So, you know, hats off. Yeah, thank you. And I think, you know, what, what, another symptom of, of bad, uh, a bad culture is high turnover. Right. So there, there's clues right there. If you've got a company that's got a very high turnover rate and I'm not, I'm not talking turnover in terms of revenue, people, I'm talking turnover in terms of staff headcount. If you're losing people and you're just like going through staff left, right and center. Right. And this is an epidemic. If you've got high turnover, probably need to look at your company culture. And, you know, there's that old expression that says people don't quit companies, they quit bosses. So I really love what you said, Steve, about you know, how that number, you know, the, the, the high level manager said, oh, um, uh, you know, productivity or results could increase by 20 percent. Your middle manager said about 40 or 45 percent. And then, you know, the, the front line people said by 80 percent. Well, why is that? It's not only that the front line people, you know, know what's going on, but they actually have probably the greatest impact. They really have the greatest impact on, on the rest of the team, their customers, the organization. So if you can make changes at that level. Um, they're they're going to be quite noticeable. So I think every company out there has got to take a look at their their turnover rate. And if the turnover rate's really high, you know, um, they, they need to be asking some serious questions about their organizational culture, right? 
Absolutely. But I, I like to flip this as well, to not only talk about cultures that are not good, I think there is a massive opportunity for any company or team for that matter to differentiate itself based on it having a brilliant culture. And mm. I think this can be a major point of difference, which frankly, not many companies have been able to achieve. And that, that creates an, an even more exciting opportunity from my perspective. How can we differentiate ourselves where we earn a reputation for having a magnificent culture? Frankly, that's what happened to Kmart in Australia and New Zealand. Right. They completely flipped a toxic, awful culture to one that um, distinguishes itself. And that, gets, that gets, can get so good that staff um, take on a role of protecting that brilliant culture. Now, when you got to that point, you know you've got it beat. Well, you never completely got this beat, but that's that's as good as the right direction. When staff become protective to um, about the fantastic culture that they are part of, and, and that's genuinely exciting. I think. I love that, Steve. So um, let, let's let's talk about this, Steve. What what should companies be doing to try to create a more uh, positive corporate culture and and sales? Okay, so this is this is where it gets exciting, Tom, because um, we've got to be able to do something about this, right? Because otherwise, this remains talk. Now, we've got a five-step process. I can talk to the first two of our five steps in our time together today. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to make a little booklet available, a PDF booklet available, if anyone is interested, that talk to all of, all of the five steps. But the first step is vitally important, and we call this envision, envision. And behind this envision step sits what I think is a golden question. The question is this, what are the key cultural attributes we need in place for us to truly be successful while making this a great place to work? Put more simply, the question is this, what does our culture need to look and feel like for us to truly be successful while making this a great place to work? Mm. Many companies inadvertently have answered that question. And the answer takes the form of values statements. My yeah. fear is that too often values statements are created in a wrong context with good intent, but in a wrong context where the question simply is, what do we want our values to be? Well, look, there's good intention behind that, but that's there's no strategic thinking behind that because that's like out to the side and separate from our strategic planning. So I mm. think we need to reframe the whole notion of values to sit as the foundation stone upon which everything, which everything sits. And that I think is the value of my question. What do mm. we need our culture to look and feel like for us to truly be successful while making this a great place to work? Tom, you gave a possible answer to that question in sharing your story. One mm. of the answers to that question could be transparency. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another should be respect. Mm. We might also have teamwork, um, but th this should be thought through carefully and considered and committed to by leaders. We need clarity and commitment to, uh, to the values of the organisation, our aspirational culture, if you like. And that's the first step. And it's critical. So, you know, uh, Steve, something that I, that, that I think about is, you know, I, I heard you, uh, and I'm, I'm a real stickler for words and language, I heard you say something like, um, you know, organizations trying to figure out what the culture should be, right? Um, my, my point of view is more like, it's not about creating, to me, creating what the culture should be. It's really about identifying what the culture is or what the values are. Like, what are they already? Like when you start with the founders and the leaders, like what are their values? And, and then at least identifying what those are and then maybe determining are they even good ones to have? You know, like for example, you know, um, as, as co-founder and, and managing director of Soko Sales Training, and then I've got my business partner and wife, Elaine. Hello, honey. Um, so she and I have certain values as individuals, right? So we run a small business. We've got a, a head count of about 10 people. I think we're at nine now, so we're almost in double digits. So we've got, you know, uh, just under 10, 10 people on the team. So the company culture, you know, 
I think start, starts with the founders, right? It's like, who are they? What are their values? What do they believe? How do they go about things? And, and, and then that kind of, you know, trickles down throughout the organization. And, and, and maybe if you've got people that are aligned with that, then things fit great. But then if people are not aligned with that, that's where you, you, you have some challenges. Do you, can, can you talk, number one, Steve, am I on the right track? And then number two, can you talk a little bit more about, about that? So, Tom, I, I, I think we're absolutely in agreement because oh, thank um, I, I, <laughs> we're going to have we're going to have you back. We're going to have you back on the show then, Steve. I mean, this is how this works. OK, <laughs> because I think it is imperative that the leaders participate. In fact, it's their responsibility to articulate the aspirational culture. But again, this is not for the sake of being soft and flowery in the interest of us being successful, truly successful while making it a great place to work, what does our culture need to look and feel like? Now, I think as leaders and as founders of the business, Tom, your personal values will feed into answer that question. There's no, you know, there's no doubt about that, that your personal values would feed in, and, and that's the way it ought to be. Hmm. Um, so I, I think we're in agreement that the starting point is to gain clarity around our aspirational culture. The order of things we might not agree with i don't know but our second step is to say well let's now we gain clarity around our aspirational culture let's now find out what the current ugrs are mm. and that is um lifting a sheet on what's really happening now um, this is where it gets even more exciting because once we gain clarity around our aspirational culture which we can call values that's fine we can then, we, we, did re, we, we had two Australian universities doing world first research in the UGRs soon after I created the concept around 30 years ago. And it was thanks to Professor Jeff Souter at the University of Western Australia that we unearthed a way to find out the current UGRs. In our research, more than 30 years ago actually, we, got, we had five companies involved in this research and we got people to think about the way we do things around here and we got them to reflect and complete the sentence to what we now call lead in sentences. So in our research, we got people to complete this sentence. Around here, customers are. Now, I wonder if any people who are listening to this would like <laughs> to ponder some of the responses we got. I think this is huge, Steve, because you know I just did a session with a group uh, uh, not long ago, and we were talking about attitude, all right? And attitude is, um, your way of thinking that influences your behavior. So to your point that I think you're making, Steve, if your way of thinking about customers is that they're honest, truthful, valuable, precious, then your behavior towards them will be a certain way. If on the yeah. other hand, your mindset, your way of thinking about customers is that they're liars, cheats, scoundrels, trying to squeeze you for every penny to drain the lifeblood out of you and annoying, then of course that will influence your behavior towards them. Is that right, Steve? Tom, this is a really interesting thing you're raising. And I, I, I've not thought of it from this angle before, but I would hazard a guess that my attitude within a work context is heavily influenced by the UGRs that I perceive drive the team that surrounds me. So if, if, everyone around me is saying customers are a pain in the neck, then that's going to influence, influence my attitude dramatically and I'm going to conform. Yeah, customers are a pain in the neck. Yeah. And we got some of that in our research with the uh, two Australian universities involved, but we didn't get all of them completed like that. We literally had customers are a pain in the neck. Actually, I've substituted one word there because it was worse than that. Customers are a pain in the neck was one response we got. Another okay. response, and I kid you not, one person wrote, customers are an interruption to my working day. I kid you not. Now, <laughs> each of these five companies involved in the research had wonderful documentation proclaiming their commitment to customer service. Mm. What a load of rubbish if yeah. they are the prevailing UGRs. Yes. So this is a classic case of there being a difference between what is written down and what yes. we're told that induction and orientation and the prevailing culture or the UGRs. So 
we, we realized through this research that we had, and thanks to Professor Jeff Suda, we had, had unearthed a powerful way to, and simple way to find out what the current UGRs are. What we do now, because that was 30 years ago, what we do now is we're a bit smarter and we craft lead in sentences to link to those aspects of our culture that we're fighting for, our values. So, for example, if respect is a value that we are fighting for, I wonder how people at your organisation would complete this sentence. Around here, people are treated. Complete the sentence. Mm. If, if transparency and openness and honesty is a value that you are fighting for, I wonder how someone at your company would complete this sentence. Around here, being open and honest gets you. If teamwork is a value that you are fighting for, I wonder how people at your company would complete this sentence. Around here, when it comes to dealing with people from other work areas, or around here when you need help. Now, this is what we do, Tom. We help people gain clarity around their aspirational culture. And then what we, we do, what is called a UGR's stock take. So we have these lead in sentences that we craft to link back to their values. And we get people to complete the sentence online. And it is riveting, gobsmacking, <laughs> sometimes confronting for leaders because they get stuff back, which is really surprising for them. Um, but we have found out what the current culture is like with regard to the culture that we need to have in place for us to be successful while making it a great place to work. It's fascinating. I love this. This is so great, Steve, um, but they're, that are all favorable, of, of course. You want to know what's really cool? No joke. I want to tell you guys something right now. Um, I dropped a message to one of, you want to talk about honesty? I, I dropped a message to one of our customers yesterday. Um, I said, hi, Bernadine. If you're watching, you'll know who you are. Hi, Bernadine. Just a quick thank you for all your support. We really appreciate it. I just dropped her that message out of the blue, you know, because I want I want to show the love. And she goes, hi, Tom, you're most welcome. And then she says, you're making me feel I did something extra. Thanks for making me feel so special. And I said, you know, you're most welcome. You've just always been so great to work with and we're grateful. And then she put a little, you know, <laughs> you know, so it's like to, to me, customers are not an interruption to my day. They're a part of my day. They're part of they're our lifeblood. And I love all of our customers, OK? And, and that comes out. I mean, this isn't just BS. This is actually what I shared. So I think it's important. Um, for, for And I share that with our team so our team gets that, that they understand that this is how we are here. And if it's not you, then there's the door. But if it is you, then we want to have you on the team. Um, love this. Yeah, customers are our important customers. Our equity start with internal. Um, and then someone says, and your purpose, why the organization exists must be above all, uh, must be customer focused. Yeah, I, I love that. Without customers, you got nothing. All right, that's so great. And then uh, Mohammed Iskandar says, customers are people who instinctively want to be treated as humans first. Yeah, what a concept. Humans first, people before profits. I love that. Okay, Steve, um, what, can, what should people be doing right now, please? Well, we should have prefaced this session, Tom, with a warning. Uh, and the warning should have been, once you, in, once you understand and become aware of UGRs, there is no off switch. Mm. So it is a little bit of a curse that I've inflicted on everyone uh, because there's no turning back from this. And I think um, uh, once you become aware of UGRs, you will see stuff that you previously have not been conscious of. So my recommendation would be to tune in to the UGRs in your workplace, mm. tune in to the UGRs with which you are conforming um, and question yourself about this. Um, do some personal reflection. Am I conforming to some negative UGRs? You know, sometimes UGRs um, have been in place for a long time and there can be legacy UGRs so that they can go beyond and through different leaders um, when there is no real reason for those UGRs to exist anymore. So simply becoming aware of this and uh, questioning yourself can can sometimes make a difference. And I love if that. You want to, 
if you really wanted to step up, you could also introduce others to the concept of UGRs and get people excited about not the, the prevailing UGRs, the current UGRs, not having to be a given. We can, mm. we can crank up this and we can get people collectively fighting for an even better culture than we've currently got. And that is genuinely exciting. Steve, I love this. You know, this is aligned with my philosophy of life, which is always questioning everything. Why do we do this? Right? right? Why are we doing this? And how, if at all, is it serving us? Right? Okay, I love this. And uh, feel free to reach out to, to Steve if you've got any questions at all about UGRs and improving workplace culture. And of course, any questions at all about sales or sales leadership, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to help. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Great to have you here. And everyone else, have a great day. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. If you want to take your sales skills to the next level and learn how to master the entire sales process, join Soco Academy and get certified in Soco Selling. The link is in the notes.